Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us on this special occasion. Let me begin by formally welcoming Dr. Cesar Bernardo Arevalo de Leon to the Wilson Center uh, as the president-elect of Guatemala. It's a great honor for us the, at the Wilson Center, the Latin American program, and for me personally to welcome you to this house devoted to Woodrow Wilson. Wilson, as you may know, uh, just was a distinguished uh, scholar and later the 28th President of the United States. It is fitting then that you should make your first public speech as President-elect at the Wilson Center where your distinguished career as both a scholar and a statesman are highly valued. For those, of an, those in our audience who have not followed developments in Guatemala the last few months or years, the emergence of Bernardo Arlevalo and the Semilla movement could be a bit of a surprise. I admit, I did not predict your victory. <laughs> I don't know, I'm not much of an expert, I guess. However, let me offer a quick review to, for our audience of how you and Guatemala have arrived at this point. With the formal end of Guatemala's Civil War in 1996, the country moved slowly through a process of demobilization and transition to formal democracy. Sadly, structures of repression and crime that operated within the state during the armed conflict devolved into parallel networks of organized crime that weakened and threatened the democratic transition. By 2006, the situation was so grave that the Guatemalan government invited the United Nations to set up an independent anti-corruption office known as CC to assist the justice system fight back against those hidden powers known as SIACs. The CCG's record was variable during the early years, but ultimately enjoyed major success in its investigation of high-level corruption, campaign finance violations, and efforts to subvert the rule of law. The most significant moment came in 2015 when the Attorney General Thelma Aldana brought corruption charges against the then President and Vice President with assistance from CC. The cases against the former president and vice president spark a broad public outpouring of anger and frustration with corruption in government and support for the country's prosecutors and the CC. Out of that public outcry emerged the Semilla movement, founded in 2017 by, among others, Bernardo Arrevalo and the recently deceased Lucrecia Hernández Mac. Their hope was to build a democratic, anti-corruption political movement that could challenge the status quo and what was, has become known as the Pacto de Corruptos. In, in the 2019 election, several Semilla members were elected to the Congress, including Bernardo Arrevalo. Despite these advances, the backlash from the Pacto de Corruptos was fierce. In league with some of the private sector and corrupt officials, they managed to shutter the CCIG in 2019. They carried out a fierce campaign of retribution against those courageous Guatemalan judges, <coughs> prosecutors, and investigators who sought to continue the anti-corruption and anti-impunity work begun by CCIG. The Pacto also pursued independent journalists, uh, human rights lawyers and defenders and community leaders, anyone who was aligned with the fight against corruption <coughs> and sought to enforce the rule of law became the enemy. The Attorney General who replaced Telma Aldana, Consuelo Porras, became the focal point of those efforts and has persecuted and prosecuted dozens of former justice officials and advocates, many of whom had to flee, and many of whom are here today and watching us online. Two others are now sitting in jail in Guatemala for essentially fulfilling their duties, not content with challenging honest judges and justice official Porras, who has been sanctioned and publicly criticized by the United States, has <coughs> pursued a strategy to undermine the elections and decertify the Semilla movement uh, and its founders 
the Supreme Electoral Tribunal and potentially even criminalize Bernardo Arrevalo, even though he was officially proclaimed uh, president-elect by the TSC in August of this year. Just this week, there have been new attacks on the electoral process, including the physical remover, removal of vote tallies by the prosecutor's office with the support of the national police. Finally, let me just say a word about the president-elect himself. As many of you know, Bernardo Arrevalo is the son of a beloved former president, Juan Jose Arrevalo Bermejo, Guatemala's first democratically elected president and who led his country during a brief shining moment for democracy in the 20th century. Bernardo Arrevalo inherits his father's legacy as well as the hopes and expectations of Guatemalans from all walks of life that are fed up with corruption, impunity, and erosion of the rule of law. Not unlike his father, uh, Bernardo Arrevalo is a scholar with studies at this, the Hebrew University of Jer Jerusalem and later a doctorate at Utrecht University. His areas especially have been in conflict resolution, working with the Center for Mesoamerican Regional Research and, the, and later at Interpeace, the Swiss-based international organization for peace building. He contributed to the work of the Wilson Center's Latin America program, and he's been here before, <laughs> uh, which he reminded of me of recently in Guatemala. So welcome again. Similarly, he enjoyed his distinguished diplomatic career as Guatemala's ambassador to Spain, as well as service as Guatemala's deputy foreign minister and also service in the U uh, Guatemalan embassy in Israel. Mr. President-elect, we understand expectations are great and the challenges that lie ahead are enorm enormous. Just making it to Inauguration Day on January 14th will be a challenge. <laughs> but it seems clear that you will have millions of allies within Guatemala and among the international community ready to <laughs> accompany and encourage you and Guatemalans along the path to democratic governance, justice, equitable economic growth that has been missing for so long. Once again, bienvenido al Wilson Center, señor presidente electo de Guatemala, doctor César Bernardo Arrevalo de León. Gracias. Well, buenas tardes. Es un gusto estar con todos ustedes acá. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, thank you very much, Eric, for the introduction. It's actually, uh, really, I want to thank the Wilson Center for inviting me today. I am very pleased to be here with you. Uh, among other reasons, because as Eric has said, I have been in the past uh, visiting the Wilson Center for other reasons when we were doing, I was doing research on civil military affairs or in peace building and other issues. So it's a pleasure to be again, although in a different capacity. Uh, well, as you all know, Guatemala is going through a difficult and uncertain transition uh, with various legal actions against, legal actions against me and my party and against the Supreme Electoral Tribunal, which are pending in the courts. This is something I did not anticipate when I won the presidential election on August 20th. I knew it would not be easy given the political conditions in Guatemala, and I expected resistance from some powerful actors, but it was not clear what type of actions to expect. What I see now is what looks like a coup in slow motion. We are facing a very tense political environment where my party, Semilla, and I are the victims of an ongoing campaign of judicial persecution by Guatemala's public ministry, headed by the Attorney General, who you may have heard is on the United States' angle list of corrupt and anti-democratic actors. She has taken legal action trying to suspend my political party, Semilla, and just this past Friday and Saturday, 
her agents raided the offices of the Electoral Tribunal for the second time, this time forcibly seizing the certified vote tallies from tribunal staff who they verbally and physically abused. This is outrageous and it is unacceptable. It represents a serious alteration of the constitutional order and should be examined by the OAS under Article 20 of the Inter-American Democratic Charter. The campaign of judicial persecution calls into question the current authority's commitment to a smooth transfer of power and intends to cast doubt on whether Semillas elected legislators will be able to exercise their full rights as a political party in Congress. We and the Guatemalan people more generally do not believe the prosecutors are acting on their own initiative. The unfortunate truth is that Guatemala has no separation of powers, and while this has been a trend over more than a decade, it has become much worse under the current administration. The public ministry, which is in charge of criminal prosecution, and the judiciary, along with much of the current Congress, are subject to presidential authority. All the public ministry's recent actions are either on shaky legal, legal ground or outright unconstitutional. These actions would never been, have been taken against our party had we not come in second place in the first round of elections in June and then won at the runoff in August. My campaign succeeded because we promised the Guatemalan people that an Arevalo administration's highest priority would put an end to the influence that corrupt and illicit networks have, for more than a decade, exerted on key state institutions and governmental agencies, including those responsible for the administration of justice. And the fear among these corrupt actors that we will be successful is precisely with what has triggered the judicial persecution and the campaign of intimidation against my party and my supporters on social net networks such as Twitter, uh, now X, TikTok, Instagram, and other platforms. The intention is clear. They want to derail or prevent my swearing as president. This effort has been ongoing since shortly after the election and has created a political environment of uncertainty and tension. It has also created a major institutional conflict between the Supreme Electoral tri Tribunal, which is supposed to have exclusive jurisdiction over election and political parties, and those institutions responsible for the administration of justice, which also, also includes the Constitutional Court. This is the situation now, three and a half months before I take office on January 14th of next year. One of my, of my first actions will be to restore independence of these and other institutions, to re-establish trust in their effectiveness through respect and support for their mission. The whole state apparatus has been weakened from inside due to the growing influence of criminal networks, and I'm aware that it will not be easy to dislodge them but we must do it. We have a clear mandate and very strong support from hundreds of thousands of citizens who want a more cohesive civil society, one that brings together student organizations, workers, indigenous organizations, citizens from different walks of life to work together to build a better country. In addition to rebuilding institutions, restoring checks and balances and upholding the rule of law, I strongly believe that open and transparent government, democratic values, the need for negotiation and compromise in politics, and recognition of freedom of thought and freedom of speech are fundamental to ensure political stability and effective governance. These are the basic principles of open societies. I know this will not be an easy undertaking. Transitions to democracy in many parts of the world were slow and difficult. It took time to build institutions and to develop democratic practices. But political changes began to move forward and gradually took hold. 
that third wave of democracy described by Huntington did gain momentum. Sadly, we have seen setbacks to democracy, not just in Guatemala, but around the world, as autocratic regimes are gaining ground and respect for basic human rights and civil liberties is being eroded gradually and systematically in some countries. While this is happening with the return of repressive practices of the past, today there are new technologies that are being used to intentionally generate mistrust and division. We are witnessing a new era where social networking platforms combined with the content creation capabilities of artificial intelligence is an entirely unprecedented threat to democratic governance. It's a very troubling development. So I am under no illusions about the challenges ahead, but I want to share with you the inspiration I drew during my campaign when I saw firsthand thousands of Guatemalans who expressed hope and belief that a better future is within our reach. Guatemala has thousands of young people who are talented and adept and untouched by the corruption that so many of the elders have fallen into. For every corrupt Guatemalan, there are many, many more who are honest and caring about their families, their communities, and their country. I am determined to empower them and to work with them to do everything that can be done in the four years we have ahead to build a social, economic, political, and judicial infrastructure that we need for a new and better Guatemala. I know I can count on the millions of Guatemalans who have placed their trust in me, and I hope that I can count on yours as well. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Many thanks and welcome back, President-elect Arevalo, to the Wilson Center. Thanks to all of you for being here. My name is Benjamin Gadan. I direct our Latin America work at the center. I think we can clearly tell from the size and interest of this audience and from our large online audience and others in the city who have greeted you so warmly that there's a lot of attention right now to the presidential transition in your country and a great deal of commitment to be allies as you, as you work your way to the presidential position. Um, so again, welcome, felicitaciones, congratulations. I, I want to quickly welcome some dignitaries who we have here as well. Ambassador Alfonso Quinones from Guatemala is here, as well as former senior officials from the White House, former ambassadors, the Special Rapporteur for Freedom of the Press from the OAS, and many other dignitaries. So thank you all for being here, um, and thank you for your support for the presidential transition in these uncertain and impactful moments in Guatemala. I, I want to begin by talking about the challenges you face right now before you take office, and then I, I promise we'll dedicate time to discussing your agenda and what you hope to achieve once, you, once you're in office. The election wasn't close. Normally, we don't think about a difficult transition period when there's a landslide victory. On August 20th, you won 17 of Guatemala's 22 provinces. Even though your initial base was thought of as, as urban and intellectual, you won in rural areas and in the highlands. You attracted 58% of the vote, um, and so you, you have tripled your representation in Congress. And despite that, as you yourself have referenced, there's a great deal of uncertainty as to whether you will even be able to take the position of president of Guatemala in January on the 14th. You have been subject to an audit of the election results that found no meaningful fraud, and yet there have been four raids on the electoral authorities, the most recent on Friday, in an effort to create the appearance of impropriety and to impede your transition. You have referred to those efforts as an attempted coup, and you did so again just now. My question for you is basic. Will you be the president of Guatemala? Oh, yes, of course. Okay. That, that I have, please, have no doubt about that. It's going to be a bumpy road. They are not making it easy for us. Uh, but I do believe that at this point in time, the level of rejection that we have in Guatemalan society all over uh, for what is being done by, you know, by these forces and by the uh, Ministerio Público, the General Prosecutor's Office, 
is really very important. We have a convergence uh, in which we have from indigenous organizations to private sector organizations, everybody agreeing on the need to respect electoral results, the need to defend uh, democratic institutions. Uh, that is providing tons of, of, of not only that there's a very clear, I mean, legally there is no question, there is a, a huge legitimacy to this. Uh, unfortunately, the people who are making this hard for everybody in the country hold positions of power and use institutions in a way, in a perverse way, uh, using institutions that have been established to deliver justice <coughs> uh, in a way that they actually betray justice and persecute people who have been uh, engaged in the fight against corruption. And we have, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad to point to many of our colleagues that have been <coughs> expelled and are exiled here in the United States because of their efforts to fight against corruption. And that's exactly uh, why they are able to generate uh, this type of doubts and uncertainty, because they have positions of power and they are abusing their institutional position. But the level of uh, support that we have, not it's not necessarily for me and for Semilla, it is support for the possibility of a different future and for uh, a, a democratic uh, Guatemala. That is what is going to make the difference. So yes, I will be sworn in on the 14th. Excellent. In that case, when you are inaugurated on January 14th, you will face enormous obstacles to implementing your ambitious agenda, the anti-corruption agenda, your agenda to increase employment, infrastructure, to fight poverty, and to address crime, including organized crime. And some of those will be structural barriers to your success. You have increased, as I said, by threefold the seats that uh, your Movimiento Semilla has in the Congress, but that still just brings you from seven to 23 seats out of a total of 160 seats in the unicameral legislature in Guatemala. The current president, Giamate, your election rival, Sandra Torres, combined will have 67 seats in the Guatemalan Congress, and at least a third of city halls of the uh, city governments will be controlled by President Giamate's party. Coalition building in the Guatemalan Congress can be difficult and can sometimes involve agreements and compromises that you and your colleagues in the Movimiento Semilla, the seed party, may not be comfortable with. My question is, what is your strategy to retain public support, given the high expectations, given how quickly many reformist leaders in Latin America recently elected have lost momentum and have had an inability to implement their agendas? And what is your strategy <laughs> for building congressional coalitions that would be necessary for you to implement your vision for Guatemala? Um, well, that's uh, <laughs> a very good question. <laughs> but I think that we're beginning to find uh, indications of a transformed reality even right now. Uh, let me begin by questioning the notion of parties. We do not have consolidated parties in Guatemala. On the level of control that a, 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 a nominal party has over its majors or its members in Congress depends on the capacity of this party to actually deliver the, go the, the, the corruption goods that, that were the cause for integrating into these movements. And that's many, if not all, of the parties in government. So what happens when that party cannot deliver the goods? And the fact that the executive branch of government has control over the main source of uh, funds that was used to oil all this corrupt uh, industry is being very clearly seen by these actors and is driving them into consider what is going to happen next. Because uh, Guatemalans here in the room will know that actually all these corrupt pacts were being achieved by agreements between you know, the executive, uh, congressmen and congresswomen, and majors uh, all over the country, and governors as well, um, using state funding for investment. But that is in our hands, and we have said that we are closing that. Uh, so 
Right now, what we are seeing is that you mentioned that 67 <coughs> uh, members of Congress are part of either the current uh, reigning government or the uh, UNE, mm -hmm. uh, Sandra Torres party. Uh, we can tell you that many of those are already beginning to look for, uh, to look away from them because they cannot deliver what they are expected to deliver. So uh, in Congress, we are seeing um, a situation in which uh, people are beginning to reassess uh, how they are going to be moving in, 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 in Parliament at the moment in which the traditional incentives uh, are disappearing. And we that doesn't change the fact that we are a minority force, but that does change the degree to which, as a minority force, we can enter into ad hoc arrangements with other actors. And we are not going to try to make agreements or alliances with parties, because as I said, parties are really flimsy, uh, very empty institutions when there is no corruption to, to keep them together. But we are going to try to make alliances around specific pieces of legislation. And we are finding out that actually that's probably something that is going to make for a much more um, rational Congress than the one that we were expecting. On the municipalities, let me tell you that uh, we had a test about ten, two weeks ago. Uh, we invited every elected major in the country to come to a meeting in Guatemala City with us. Uh, and we did so without inviting any member of Congress, not of any party, not even our party. Mm. Because what has happened in the past is that actually this corrupt system is being driven by clientelistic networks that have members of Congress as their heads. So because they are the ones that have control of the goodies that come out of the national budget, then they are able to you know, deal and negotiate with majors. Uh, but we were very clearly, we had already sent a message between the first and the second round stating very clearly that we, are, we were telling the majors that we don't care with which party they were elected, that we don't care who are they going to support, either or <coughs> us or Sandra Torres, that our, committed as uh, our commitment as elected officials is to work with every elected official, because we have a common commitment with the people. So in the invitation that we made in Guatemala City, uh, we had 250 majors coming out of 340, mm -hmm. even though they the government and the UNE uh, did a campaign of actually calling mm -hmm. each and every major in the party to tell them that if they come to our meeting, they were going to probably uh, face whatever type of sanctions, and I don't know what they have uh, upon them. And I, it, it was very interesting to see these 240 majors actually beginning to speak up about w how pressed they felt and extorted they felt with this relationship because they were forced to give money for every program and so on and so forth. I'm not saying that they are you know, children that were being abused, but it's very clearly that people were feeling trapped into this logic of corruption that is no longer going to work. So what we are saying is that there is a realignment of political forces which uh, is going in a direction that we are still need to see. But we are very clear that uh, it will be wrong for us to try to make uh, governance uh, in, in Guatemala depend on the relationship between Congress and the executive branch. So we are already starting to build uh, uh, agreements and convergence between different social actors, I indigenous peoples and the NGOs and uh, academic actors and the private sector, because we believe that actually what we need to do is to try to foster the the emergence of consensus on different key issues and pieces of legislation between society as a social agreement that then can find its way <coughs> into the political system at Congress. Instead of trying to limit ourselves to trying to deal with 
you know, th that very unpredictable situation. And we are finding that actually there's quite a lot of interest so that pieces of ladies issues that we are going to try to promote, for example, like uh, uh, civil service law, a new civil service law, uh, how to build up and uh, structure the national anti-corruption system and so on and so forth is going to be the subject of, a, of an open discussion with different actors in society, find out the consensus that we are able to forge strongly led by academic institutions that, so that we are sure that we have evidence-based, uh, an evidence-based core, and then bring in political actors in Congress. And I believe that that way we're going to be finding different ways to build a structure of governance for a government in which our party will still remain a minority party. L let me ask you about a very different set of challenges you might face, which is if you're too successful or too successful too quickly, which is potential backlash from, from status quo forces in Guatemala. Um, we have called this conversation the Primavera Democratica, the, the Democratic Spring. That's an expression that we've heard before in Guatemalan history in the 1940s when your father was president, um, and more recently when CICIG, when the United, the United Nations Anti-Corruption Agency was established in, in Guatemala, neither experience ended well for the country. The experience of your father and his successor ended in a, in a coup d'etat and, and decades of very brutal civil war in Guatemala. For those who haven't followed recent Guatemalan history, my colleague Eric Olson, our global fellow who was in Guatemala for the recent elections, referenced how it ended with the UN, which after a very successful period of improving the rule of law, of rooting out corruption and impunity, including an investigation that led to a president and vice president being incarcerated for their corrupt acts, you had two successive presidents try to dismantle all of that anti-corruption infrastructure. They ended the mandate for CICIG, for this UN agency. They eventually persecuted the prosecutors and judges, many of whom are here today, um, causing them to either end up in prison themselves or live in exile, um, and have created maybe even more of an environment of impunity than existed before the CICIG experiment began in the first place. This so-called Pacto de Corruptos having reacted to a real threat of the way of life and the businesses and relationships with government that they depended upon to carry on their illicit activities. My question for you is why will it be different this time around? Why is this Primavera Democratica more apt to succeed in a sustainable way? Well, I, I, two general issues first. Well, I think that one of the dangers that we have in social sciences is to try to predict the future exclusively in the basis of the past. And that is a general statement. The second one is that from history we know that peoples, countries, regions succeed in breaking cycles of violence and negative relations at certain point in order to take new paths into, I, into you know, virtue circles or, or sustained development or whatnot. Uh, remember that, for example, I'm, I'm a, when I was doing research on issues of violence, well, right now, you know, the very peaceful region of Western Europe was less than 100 years ago one of the most violent of the world and had been so <coughs> for the last for the previous thousand years. And nevertheless, there was a point in which they were able to break the cycle and go out. So I don't know if we're going to make it and we're going to be the ones that succeed in breaking the cycle and that if this is going to be the definitive spring that then will allow the country to thrive and maybe we will fail and uh, there will be another attempt afterwards uh, if we fail. But I think that we cannot do is not try and not attempt to do it. And I think that we have a need to believe that this is possible. And I take this from my own knowledge of history. We, I know that people, peoples and countries can break out of negative cycles. And there are moments in which societies suddenly become, for some reason that nobody really understands, better able well, ex post, everybody understands, but <laughs> never at, at the moment in which you are, are better able to, to go ahead. I do believe, and what I see now is the fact that, we, that I am here with you today, 
uh, is because there has been a change in Guatemalan society. You know, I believe that revolutions happen not uh, because th the revolutionaries make the changes. I believe that revolutions happen because the changes make the revolutionaries. And, and I believe that we have been just catalytic actors of something that is happening, that is which is happening is that it's a change in the, in, in, in the attitude of society in terms of supporting or, 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 or better said, rejecting, uh, you know, what has been up until there, some sort of uh, resignation to corruption and to the type of abuse that everybody was, uh, that was suffering, and that actually uh, this is the change that has to be sustained. I think that our challenge is to sustain this change and that if this change, this transformation of attitudes is sustained, that actually came out of youth, because it was youth the ones that decided to go for Semilla, and, and they, they illusioned and, 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 and the, the, their parents and, and, and their uncles and whatnot. Uh, if we succeed to sustain this transformation, then the change can be sustained. But l so let me be just slightly more specific, because I agree entirely the Guatemalan people are behind you overwhelmingly. We saw that with the election results. We've seen that with mobilizations in the streets of Guatemala City and other areas in defense of your election victory and the rights of voters. Um, the backlash I'm referring to is a backlash of a smaller yeah. group, but a powerful group. You've mentioned social science. I don't know if you saw a recent article in the Journal of Democracy that has just come out talking about how you built this coalition and were able to win the election, but it warns and I quote the article, it says, political or judicial challenges that threaten rent-seeking and corruption or the reign of impunity tend to run into a united front against reform. That united front, the author's reference, is not a massive movement against you, far from it. It's a smaller group, but one that you yourself have acknowledged hold the levers of power in Guatemala, at least today. Well, I think that what we're doing, and I, think, I, I believe that we have succeeded in doing, there is... The, the number of actors that are willing to sustain the system of corruption now in a way that actually uh, drives them to attempt against democracy is uh, every day m smaller. And we are seeing it because of the way in which different social actors are coming forward with the, the calls for you know, upholding uh, institutions and so on and so forth. Um, they, of course, and, and, and this is very important, they are not going to disappear. Uh, they are going to remain there. They are going to, you know, I know that, for example, you know, we have a huge level of penetration of corrupt actors into the courts of justice, and they are not going to disappear. They are going to, there are going to be elections in the future. But I think that insofar as we are able to build up a counter uh, alliance of actors, their capacity to have influence in uh, to, to to determine the, the the political system is going to diminish significantly. So I am not making no. I'm not saying that this is going to be easy by in in, in any way. It's going to be extremely challenging. But I do believe that, and I believe that we are seeing now the the the, the beginning. Uh, of the emergence of new different coalitions of the ones that we have seen in the past. And that these realignments are the ones that are going to be uh, uh, critical for preventing a backlash. Not preventing a backlash, the backlash will happen, but from preventing a backlash that uh, enjoys a huge impact in and, uh, and has the danger of derailing our efforts. Let's talk about one of the groups uh, in particular, and that's the private sector in Guatemala. There are those who would say the entire private sector, at least its, its traditional elites, are working against you and maybe behind what you've seen as efforts, as you've described them, as a coup d'etat to impede you from taking office. Um, but it seems that that's not the case, that there is some heterogeneity. We did see a fragmentation of, of economic elites, many including institutional um, statements came out in support of your election victory and in support of a peaceful democratic transition of power. And either way, working with the private sector, I imagine, will be key to your success, to attracting investment, to creating jobs, to making sure there's governability. What is your observation right now of the state of your current relationship 
with the private sector and the ways you think you could deepen that relationship going forward? Well, I think that we have been able to, first of all, have a very clear and frank conversation with the private sector. Mm -hmm. And I think that heterogeneity was there before the elections. And I think that after the elections, uh, that heterogeneity has just grown. Mm -hmm. And we have more diverse views. I do believe that there are still some actors in the private sector that are continue to fund and finance institutions like... Uh, Fundación contra el Terrorismo, which uh, are the ones that are driving the Ministerio Público in, in most of, uh, of their actions. Uh, but my impression is that uh, they are fewer, way fewer than before, and they are operating without the tolerance of other actors who are beginning to migrate <coughs> out, of, out of that situation. I, about two years ago, I had a conversation with a... Uh, with, uh, somebody from the private sector had that had been the head of uh, one of the gremiales. And this person told me that the problem, as, as, as uh, it was understood by, by, by a group uh, of them, is that actually there was a moment in which, for different reasons, the private sector made an alliance with these corrupt cliques and began to operate in sync but that actually, and that was about two years ago, at that moment, many of them had already realized that it was extremely difficult for them as a sector, but that they just didn't know how to end their relationship and come out of it. So I think that it's about finding that type of moments and opportunities to try to find uh, new alignments. And I, I, I probably what I want to say is very clearly, the political alignments that we have seen before the elections in Guatemala have changed. Mm. We have new dynamics, we have different actors coming forward and playing, and I'm not saying that this is going to save the country, I'm just saying that this is going to be a very different political game, and that we cannot rely on understanding how alliances were in the past. Uh, th these, that knowledge is not sufficient to predict how this is going to happen in the future. And it is our challenge as government to try to find out a way so that these new convergences are going to turn for the right and become a part of, of, of our way into development and away from corruption. You've taken time to come to Washington at a moment of great uncertainty in Guatemala. You're a very busy person. And so to me, that signals a recognition of the importance of the international community right now in Guatemala's democratic history. And so I want to ask about the role of the international community over the past several months and the past several years, if you'll permit it. Your first round electoral performance certainly awakened great interest in Guatemala, which it merits at all times. It's the largest country in Central America and, and a key driver of political and economic trends throughout the region with great impacts on the United States. The European Union and the Organization of American States observed the election and have remained very engaged in the political transition themselves and have been very clear in their condemnation of efforts to impede your peaceful transition of power. The same is true or even more so of the United States, which has been very involved, repeatedly congratulating you at every level for your electoral victory, sending a very clear signal over and over again um, that the expectation in Washington is that you take office and that no one stands in your way from doing so. My question is, has the international community done enough? Should the United States and its allies have been more active earlier in the election, for example, when three major candidates were disqualified from running on seemingly arbitrary decisions? Should the United States have been more active earlier to maintain CCIG and the UN presence in Guatemala? Should the United States have played a role in defending after CCIG left Guatemala the individuals, prosecutors, investigators, judges who were hounded by the Attorney General's office and eventually had to leave the country? And are the tools available to the United States and international community adequate for defending democracy in critical moments like this? Is the Inter-American Democratic Charter, for example, an adequate tool and being implemented adequately? It strikes me that we're at a moment for evaluating the commitment of the international community and the tools available, because I can't think of a more relevant and urgent example of democratic backsliding, but the promise of a democratic future, a primavera democratica, than what you're experiencing right now in Guatemala. 
Wow. Okay, you. <laughs> That's a question for a dissertation, actually. <laughs> you give me three years and I will probably come uh, and, and have another piece. You're welcome. After your presidency, yeah. come back once more here. Uh, write your memoirs. Uh, look, I think that indeed there is a huge challenge at the international le level to try to develop adequate instruments to deal with cases not only like Guatemala, but many others in Latin America and all over the world. Um, we are seeing that more and more and more, and more there is backs authoritarian backsliding, even in the European continent. And not, we don't have to look exclusively in Latin America or uh, even in the United States. Sorry for mentioning it, okay? Uh, so uh, I, I think that we are not in a position to take democracy for granted. And in terms of how the international community can support a country that is facing this type of challenges, there is always a huge tension, that is my belief, from having worked it at the international level, between two fundamental principles. The principle of uh, non-interference in internal affairs, and the uh, responsibility to protect, which are uh, very different points in time, right? So one point on, on the need to respect some level of sovereignty, and then the whole question comes into where does sovereignty lie? And I believe that actually uh, the, the answers that, for example, the Guatemalan government has been giving are absolutely absurd. That, that is a 19th century definition of sovereignty that 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 uh, goes counter everything that we know in terms of respect for human rights and so on and so forth. Uh, but there is also uh, this principle of responsibility to protect that also has to be considered very carefully in terms of when is the right moment to intervene and who defines uh, when is the right moment to intervene and up until uh, what limit you go. Uh, in to intervene, and there are no simple questions to that. There are no, uh, because every, m every case is going to be very different, and you know, giving an answer this to a context like Rwanda uh, in the 1990s is very different to the case that you have in, in Guatemala today. There, there, there are principles and there are intentions, and we have to understand this. I think that the m fundamental problem is whether the international community has the political will to act in defense of democracy or not, wherever there is a problem. I think that was more clear in the past, in, and, and in the past I'm saying the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, I think that we have seen it, uh, that it's less clear in, in, in the last decade, and, and, and that is making much more difficult to operate in these cases. But I would like to think that the Guatemalan case today provides an opportunity to actually you know, try to build up a better understanding of how to operate and a renewed commitment with the, with the principle of, of, of upholding democratic institutions. We have been very surprised, uh, uh, pleasantly surprised by the fact that actually uh, the currency, uh, our current fight for democracy in Guatemala has attracted support from every corner or the of the ideological, well, not every, but from every uh, corner from the democratic spectrum from right to left. Uh, we have had, you know, and, and I mentioned it, we have the Grupo de Puebla expressing support, and we have uh, the IDEA uh, meeting of, of, of conservative presidents providing support. And that makes that there is, there, there is an understanding that actually this is not about a, a government in the right or left. This is a government fighting for democracy and fighting a very real challenge for democracy that we had not really understood uh, properly up until now. We, you know, we understood the challenges of transition to democracy mostly in terms of going from repressive <coughs> governments that are violating human rights uh, and then we have all this framework for transitional just, uh, justice uh, that has, you know, prosecution and protection of human rights and so on and so forth. Well, I think that there are other, other 
issues that deserve attention from this perspective in terms of trans transition of challenges. And corruption is one of them. And I think that we have not really fucked corruption in terms of a transitional challenge on how do you go from an utterly corrupt society to uh, one that has rejected this type of attitudes. And, and that is something that we would like to, to help develop because I think that we are going to be facing that challenge in Guatemala in the, in, in the forthcoming years. So I think that for us, the international presence has been extremely useful. Uh, had, not, had, uh, had not been uh, for the presence, the international observance by the OAS, by the European Union, other international observances, the national observances, and the, the, the level in which they converged about you know a, a very strong statement that all these narratives about fraud uh, were absolutely false, then uh, the internal actors would have been much, internal actors acting against uh, democracy would have been much more emboldened. And it also provided uh, a clarity to some actors that actually understood that, well, so this is the way that we are, this is being seen internationally and enabled them to move from certain positions into the other. So I think that international action is critical. I think that the, uh, the OAS charter uh, is critical and th th the only issue that we have to be very careful about is that the level of political will will change in time and according to the different governments and then <coughs> how do you use it is very, com uh, very complicated, you cannot foresee how this is going to be used today and how it's going to be in 10 years' time. We're running out of time. I have one more dissertation topic for you that I, that I want to present. Um, and it's also applying lessons regionally and, and perhaps even globally. And that's the merit and challenge of participating in electoral processes that are not necessarily entirely free or entirely fair. In Venezuela, of course, is probably the most compelling example we have in the Americas, but I think, unfortunately, this is becoming even more common. Elections where not all candidates are permitted to compete where the media is not permitted to play its free role in covering the issues of importance, um, where campaign finance and the role of an incumbent party leave the playing field far from level. And yet, it would appear to be the story of your election that it's worth engaging and that the results can be unexpected and can generate great momentum at an inflection point for a country. But, but let me not answer the question, but rather ask it. What are the lessons uh, from your election for opposition movements in countries that are not quite democratic and not quite authoritarian, um, where opposition movements want to use elections as an opportunity to regain power? Well, I, I think that in countries in which you have both elements of authoritarian rule and elements of democratic rule, participating is fundamental in order to bring the challenges of democratic participation to the fore. We were oftentimes questioned whether we would be our participation was actually justifying uh, the status quo because nobody believed that we could win the election. And then the people were saying, oh no, you're going to be just there and, and justify what is going on and legitimize the result. And we said, look, we have to, uh, it's either that and we make an effort or we just give up because there, what other option do we have to fight this thing that we're living? Mm -hmm. And we decided to go through and there were many people that were actually calling for a, uh, uh, how do you call, el voto nulo. Uh, how do boycott, you call? essentially. Well, boycott the elections, basically, which is not exactly because people were going and casting their vote uh, and just uh, annulling it. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, and that was actually, in the first round of elections, there was a very strong showing. I don't remember if it was the first or the second uh, the winning uh, result would have been the, 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 the voto nulo. Uh, by the second round, it completely disappeared because they had already understood that there was something that could be done. And I think that if there is a chance, really we don't have the right not to make the effort. And I would say that that is the challenge that... Uh, we all that believe in strengthening democratic institutions in this proto-democratic, uh, questionable democratic, weak democratic environments uh, need to make. We need to participate. 
and and we need to you know challenge the system from within please join me in thanking president elect bernardo revalo and wishing him luck in this important moment in guatemalan history